Thanks, Alistair. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd just like to extend my thanks to Beata and Bart for inviting me here today. It's a, a privilege to present at this conference. Um, I'm going to talk to you about Catchment Restoration Fund in particular, uh, a, a program that I manage. Um, it's a slight change in the title to the, that's in the brochure because I'm focusing on catchment restoration rather than specifically river restoration because we're trying to build this up on a large scale. And how we're trying to integrate that with its primary aim, which is the Water Framework Directive, um, but also building some of the benefits that, that we're bringing forward for Flood Directive and Natura 2000 sites. Just an a, a outline of the presentation, I just want to give you a, a very brief background of the Catchment Restoration Fund, how we selected projects to go forward for that fund, um, the, the projects that received money. Uh, I'll give you a quick program update. Uh, we're in the final three years now. The program will finish in March uh, 2015, so we're well on the way to uh, delivering all our projects. And then I want to focus on some of the outcomes that we want to realise longer term for the fund in terms of the Water Framework Directive and look at some of the outputs, some of the deliverables that we've, um, we've got on the ground today um, and then look at outcomes and outputs for flood risk management, tying that into Flood Directive and the same for Natura 2000 as well. Then I want to just say a little bit about the added value we get from the people that are delivering these projects because that's really important. Um, it's something Beata mentioned that um, a lot of the money that we're giving out is to Rivers Trust and other charitable trusts and they bring a lot of people value to that as well. A Lo lot of local ownership, which is helping us achieve what we want to do. And then I'll just say something about future options we have for the funding as well. In terms of the background, um, the money was provided by the UK government um, for the Environment Agency in the UK to administer on behalf of the government to give to charitable trusts. Um, there's a lot of work we're doing for Water Framework Directive through the Environment Agency and other statutory bodies, but this was specifically given money to charitable trusts to do some of the project work that we wanted. So the projects um, at a catchment level had the aims of restoring natural features in and around watercourses, reducing the impact of man-made structures on wildlife in watercourses, something we've spoken about a lot today, and reducing the impact of diffuse pollution that arises from rural and urban land use. Um, so a whole sort of like catchment approach, loads of different issues to tackle. We also wanted to sort of like recognise some of the additional benefits that these projects might bring as well. We wanted the projects to demonstrate that they were working in collaboration and partnership uh, with other organisations, that they had considered flood management aspects of their projects as well. They had a look at the socio-economic benefits of their projects and all the projects were doing what they could in terms of biodiversity. The uh, map on the right is an England-only fund. Um, we've, we've got a good geographical spread of projects around England. Um, there's some concentrated areas where um, some of the trusts are doing very well and very successful in, in, in obtaining the funding. So in terms of the selection process, please don't worry about the diagram on the right. Um, that just uh, kind of illustrates the process we went through to actually uh, select the projects we wanted to fund. Um, there were some basic eligibility tests. Um, the projects that received the money had to be charitable trusts. They had to be undertaking work that wasn't a statutory requirement that other government agencies should be doing and other initial criteria like that. Then we tried to understand the catchment priority, so how important these projects were within given catchments. And we did that through our River Basin District Liaison Panels, uh, groups of people set up to try and shape the direction of our River Basin Management Plans. So we asked them for their priority um, that they thought this, this project carried within their catchment. Then we had to do some tests around confidence in delivery of the projects. Some of the trusts that we um, asked to do these projects were quite new, didn't have as, as much experience um, in these sort of projects as others. So we had to have confidence that they were going to deliver their projects based on the money they were giving. And we did that through undertaking technical assessments. Um, the Environment Agency did some of that, Natural England in the UK um, did that as well, uh, specifically in, in respect of Natura 2000 sites. And we also used the UK River Restoration Centre as kind of an independent check on what we were doing, just to make sure that um, the projects were deliverable. Then we had a national assessment panel that looked at all the projects that we proposed to fund just to make sure that it fitted with the priorities around the country and we had a good geographical spread and, and difference in activities. 
Very brief program update. Um, like I said, the money's gone out to charitable trusts. Um, we have 42 projects nationally at the moment over this three-year cycle. And there are a mix of urban projects, rural projects, uh, some on a catchment scale where there's small, sub, sort of small catchments where um, we're undertaking measures on the whole catchment. And there's some sp site-specific projects as well. These are where, for example, we have fish passes that are the link to opening up the whole catchment in terms of benefits. The projects themselves range in value. Um, they range from £89,000, which is 112, um, 112,000 euros, up to £2.1 million. So our biggest project is worth over £2 million. That's €2.65 million. Euros. Um, overall, the program's worth just under £25 million. Um, but one of the benefits of going through charitable trusts is they've brought their own funding into this as well. And they're bringing in uh, around 5.25 million pounds, which is over 6 million euros. So we're at about 20, 25% partnership funding into this as well, which is a real benefit. There's lots we've been doing in terms of proactive communications on the program. Um, numerous press releases when projects do work. Um, there's a lot of interest in the fact that trusts are actually doing this work. Uh, we, we've produced all these project briefing notes as well for all the projects that we use for um, for uh, conferences. Um, and there's news items every now and again that relate to the projects, where, for example, we've had recent flooding in the UK, and some of the projects are demonstrating natural flood risk management. They've been on news items for that. And the uh, BBC TV in the UK has a program called Country File that we sort of like appear on quite regularly, highlighting the work of the projects and the trusts. Also, what I'm doing in the background is trying to look at alternative sources of funding. So big funding pots within the UK, such as a Heritage Lottery Fund, to see if we can bolster these projects. And that sort of like ties into our future funding as well, trying to find as much funding as possible to keep these projects going. So I'd like to now just look at the, the um, outcomes and outputs. In terms of water framework directives specifically, the outcomes, and these are sort of like longer term outcomes we want to realise, um, the projects are actually working on over 300 water bodies. Um, so there's a, a lot of water bodies that the work, work is affecting. Now, in our initial sort of like uh, estimations, 81 of those will move from moderate to good by 2021 and a further 22 by 2027. So we're recognising that these aren't all quick fixes. You can't do everything overnight. Some, some things take time to, to actually deliver. 105 water bodies, we think we're going to be protecting no deterioration, so things won't get worse. And in terms of individual elements, statuses on water bodies, 393, we think will get improvements as well. So there's some key facts and figures in terms of the outcomes. Those are the longer term things. In terms of the outputs, now I measure 29 outputs for, for the programme. I won't run through all of these, but I'll just give you some examples. Um, so far, we've installed eight technical fish passes, um, some really large ones, some big, large Lorinier fish passes over sort of like four or five metre high structures, that sort of thing. Um, we removed 43 weirs and barriers, um, but having heard how many <laughs> barriers there are in Europe at the moment, we're just chipping away very slowly at this at the moment, but it's a start. Um, We've uh, put in 145 kilometres of fencing. This is on agricultural land to um, try and stop diffuse pollution uh, sources. So, and that, that, that's a measure that goes up quite quickly as well. It's quite an easy thing to achieve. Um, but probably quite importantly as well, 739 businesses so far have changed their ways of working based on the information that the projects are given to them to sort of like actually try and implement better environmental practice. And the two pictures here, on the top, we have a, a bypass around a weir that is installed on the River DNS in the northeast, and the bottom right, um, this is a, a river in Norfolk where there's been some introduction of large woody debris. Um, in terms of flood management, this, is kind of, this was kind of an aside um, to the catchment restoration fund. The long-term outcomes, we want to so like, try and get into place as many natural flood risk management elements as we can. Um, again, the River Restoration Centre helped us for, uh, um, undertake a review of all the projects to see what projects actually had natural flood risk management elements to them. And we identified out of the 42 projects, 31 had those elements in there, but only 11 of those projects actually identified that they had those benefits. So, you know, there, there were 
20 projects that were doing things that they didn't realise would actually help with flood risk management. Um, so we're trying to share that around to show people how what they do to help meet Water Framework Directive objectives can actually help to meet flood risk management objectives as well. So that was a good review we did. Um, we did. In terms of the output, some of the examples of stuff that's being done at the moment, re-meandering, creating capacity in water courses, um, re-bed construction, um, providing space for water, some floodplain reconnection, so actually opening up space for water again in flood situations. We've got quite a few urban and rural sustainable drainage schemes um, underway, um, some deculverting as well, opening up uh, water courses and some natural water retention, backwaters and other um, elements like that that are helping on this front. And again, the pictures here on the top right, we have some deculverting there. That water course used to run through a pipe. There's flooding issues upstream of this. Um, that's been opened up now called daylighting in the UK. And it's not only created um, some measures for flood risk management, but it's created habitat and it's helping us meet water framework directive objectives too. On the bottom right, this is a uh, sustainable drainage scheme that we have in North London, right in the heart of North London, uh, where there's uh, traditional pollution problems with surface water runoff and flood risk problems with it as well. So that project, this is before planting has taken place on, on the far side of that picture. So a demonstration of these things have been done in urban environments too. Moving on to Natura 2000, so key to what we wanted to do was meet some of the Nature Directive um, objectives too. Um, some of the longer term outcomes is um, protected areas had a, a key priority in the work we were doing. Uh, there's some of the priority species improvements we wanted to affect as well, and as much habitat enhancement as possible in delivering these projects. Some of the outputs, um, some of what we delivered today, to date, um, and this is based on the end of year two out of the year, uh, out of the three year program. 32 kilometers of channel features restored and created, uh, 124 kilometers of bankside features restored, 68,000 trees planted. Um, so, you know, that's helping with flood risk management elements as well, as well as creating habitat. Um, we've got some hectareage of U UK biodiversity action plan habitat created and some restored as well. And just a measure of, um, a lot of the projects have been run by Rivers Trust because uh, the programme was seen as very much river restoration um, on a wider scale. But bringing in the biodiversity and um, other nature directive requirements, we're seeing trusts such as uh, RSPB, Royal Society for Protection of Birds, and Freshwater Habitats Trust, Game Wildlife Conservancy Trust, lots of wildlife trusts, and the National Trust, which is a big landowner in England, they're all doing projects as well. So it shows that we're going beyond the normal, more narrow remit of river restoration. In terms of added value, uh, people, what the people are bringing to these projects, um, this is really key. Um, giving the money to the charitable trust is real, real other benefits as well. And I truly believe that you don't get these projects delivered unless you've got the people with the actual drive and ambition to do them. So money, that's always an important thing. Um, they brought in an extra five million pounds to the project, which is really important. They're not seen as a regulator as well. The second point there, which is quite important, the Environment Agency has a regulatory role, obviously, in, in England. And sometimes when we turn up on farms, for example, farmers are very skeptical because they think we've got a regulatory role. So these trusts get in there and Immediately, farmers are sort of like more receptive to taking advice from them. So that's a really good plus point. Landowner liaison, again, that works. You know, some landowners work more favorably with trust rather than the environment agency if they're seen as regulators because we have sort of like flood risk management responsibilities as well. So we get a bit of more better buy-in on, the, on that, that side of things. Um, we have one trust actually that... Um, they, they invite farmers out on open days and they get them kick sampling in streams and that's become very competitive now where farmers are saying that they've got more invertebrates in their streams than other farmers and they're phoning each other up and telling them each other that as well. Um, we have a good tie into academia as well. Um, the trust work with, with universities very well so we get lots of extra monitoring and evaluation done through universities that we might not necessarily get as a government organisation. Obviously, local knowledge is key to this as well. Um, some of the trusts really know these rivers inside out, so can lend that expertise. 
Um, we're building up local tractor skill bases as well. So where we're getting civil engineering companies in to do fish passes and barrier removals, rather than doing that on large civil companies nationally, we're doing that on local contractors, and that's building up a real skill base with them. All the trusts are sharing good practice, um, so they talk to each other, and where things work well, they'll, they'll, they'll tell each other. And when they don't work, they'll tell each other as well. It's just as important to learn from the things that don't go well. They're sharing lots of kit and expertise, and they've got a genuine passion for the work they're doing. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention as well is because we're doing this work through um, charitable trust, we, we've opened up this massive volunteer network as well in comparison to the size of the programme we've got. Um, I totaled up the figures last week, actually, and over the 42 projects, we've now got 2,700 volunteers involved, over 42 projects, which is a large number of people. And on average, they're giving up 17 and a half hours of their time. Um, they've given up that time over the last two years. So that's over 47,000 hours of volunteer input we've had to this. That's real stakeholder engagement because people are not only buying into the project aims and objectives, they're actually giving their, their time to deliver on it as well. Now, I saw this um, bunch of volunteers uh, about six months ago. Now, you have to get the language right because if I went to them and said to them, I really like your work, because you're helping me comply with a European directive, I think they would have chased me off with those sticks. Um, but because I went and said to them, we're giving you money to improve your local environment for wildlife, reduce flood, flood risk, and you know, just generally make things better, then they're really engaged in the process. Just a few closing words, really, on the future. Um, I'm working with the UK government at the moment to try and secure more money for next year. On a one-year basis, we've got a general election in the UK next year, and that means we only get money for one year because <laughs> nobody will commit beyond that. Um, I'd like to work longer term than that, so get another programme established on a three- to five-year basis following next year. But future funding, we, we've set up now catchment partnerships based on our catchment-based approach, so every catchment has the catchment partnership, which is made up by some of the trusts that I've mentioned. And any future project funding, we will push through the catchment partnership. So those guys will get the opportunity to deliver their projects. We'll be concentrating on protected areas, so the Natura 2000 side of things. We'll also be concentrating on no deterioration, making sure things aren't going to drop from where we are now. We are going to have to factor in economics as well. I also run a team in the agency that's done cost-benefit analysis on all the measures required to get to good status. Um, we're we're playing with those figures at the moment because the numbers that come out of that are really large and there's a certain amount of affordability. So we'll concentrate our effort on where we get the biggest return for the money invested. And also what we'll look at is river basin management plans. We've just released um, second cycle draft plans for consultation. But on the same day we released those, we released um, flood risk management plans for consultation as well. So hopefully people are getting the message that we're trying to join this together as much as we possibly can. So that's the future. And I'd just like to finish by saying thank you and a quick round of pictures here. Um, up here on the top left, we have a reed bed that's picking up um, rural uh, pollution from septic tanks. We've got some fencing down here on the left, some of the stock proof fencing I was talking about. Some fish easement work on the top right and We've got a, a Lorinier fish pass on the bottom right. Um, so just a demonstration of some of the project outputs. Thank you for your attention.